Hi and welcome to episode 17 of Every Semicolon. Um, this episode I'm going to do a number of things. There's some new art assets that Shane's created so I'm going to start integrating some of that um, see how that works. So he started making some uh, art for the clouds so we'll see how that goes. I haven't really tested it out yet, don't really know um, exactly what we're going to do there so we'll put them in and, and see how they look. Um, as well we've got uh, uh, skybox as well for for the cloud system. So there's a there's a model and, and a skybox, and also um, the beginnings of the cannon. So that's pretty cool. We're going to chuck that in, and maybe maybe get the cannon operating as well. So we have another type of weapon in there. Um, the cannon is is still sort of unfinished, but something to uh, to put in. Okay. Um, just looking at this here now. Actually, I'm thinking I should probably do up the the walls like I have over here a while ago. Where I uh, staggered sort of the um, the brick uh, layout here, so that it would crumble in a more um, well, it's more structurally sound, I guess. You know, this one you knock over one of these, and the entire vertical strip of wall collapses. Whereas here, uh, with this sort of staggered, um, you know, I'm sure there's some sort of uh, terminology for it, bricklaying terminology, but you know, it's it's much more structurally sound, and it looks more realistic when it's hit and, and destroyed. So. Let's um, let's get rid of all these these bricks here and, and pro replace them with uh, ones like that. Um, what's the quickest way here to do this? Might actually be let's just go through and it'd be good to build some sort of level editor for for this. I'm not really sure what that would be, how it would work, but doing what I'm doing right now is sort of tedious. And I can imagine on more complicated levels, um, it's going to be pretty frustrating. But on the, uh, I guess on the other hand, um, the more complicated the level, the less you really want a level editor that's restrictive. So, if I made one, it would be something that's useful for for typical formations like building these sort of walls and obviously I've got those um, I've got the all these you know duplicate above and move around things which are pretty handy but when it comes to these walls in, in different uh, yeah um, when it comes to something more intricate or, or, or I guess not a, a sort of grid based layout um, having the ability to just place things wherever you want is, is going to be pretty handy so the level editor would be more of a still just more I guess tools that would help lay things out and not a, a way of restricting what you can do alright so I'll get this sorted out and then we'll start chucking in those clouds I think um, Got had a comment on uh, I think episode eleven from J Godfrey zero one, um, and he was asking about the how I do the uh, scene view camera controls. Um, I guess because I make it look easy, um, but really it's it's just um, I guess you know I, I use Unity every single day, um, a lot of the day so. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pretty used to it. Um, mainly, what I do is is use Alt and left click to rotate around, and, I, and middle mouse button to pan. Um, when I do this, and, and and I can also either use the scroll wheel or, or right click to zoom. Um, so when I'm looking around something specific like this castle, what I'll do is um, I'm always sort of conscious of what I have sort of frame selected in a lot of ways. You know the uh, hitting the F key focuses on something and then that's going to be where you rotate around where the camera is sort of orbiting um, as you hold down alt and, and move the left mouse button or hold down the left mouse button and alt and move the mouse um, and you can sort of zoom out and I can you know, rotate around that specific thing but if you pan um, then the orbit point will be shifted to sort of where you've panned um, the distance from where you were uh, it's like it's like if uh, I focus on the, the cube 
and it's orbiting at a point, you know, three meters from the camera, and I pan across here three meters, and then now uh, the, the orbit point will be sort of three meters in this direction, and as I rotate around, I'll be rotating around that point, so. Uh, you know, just keeping conscious of that sort of thing, what you're panning around at any particular time, you know, I, I like to do something, so I might, if I want to rotate around this whole castle, I might, from a distance, focus on, on the, uh, the platform, and then I'll probably pan up, and zoom in, and then start you know, rotating around the castle um, and just shifting my pan position as I see fit depending on what I want to look at. Um, for when I'm moving around the scene quickly I'll typically just use the WASD um, and hold right mouse button to rotate the camera around so like first person shooter controls um, holding down shift to increase the speed um, and in 3.5 I think they added this whole um, shift uh, changes it accelerates over time. Um, I'm not uh, necessarily a big fan of it because it does just seem to get to a ridiculous speed. Um, it'd be nice if they provided some settings for that. Um, but anyway, you can also use the mouse wheel to increase your speed of uh, movement as you go around, um, and and your your speed of scrolling, uh, your zooming will be based on what you have. Um, frame selected or focused on. Um, so if I select that, um, yeah, and things. I think also, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what is what causes the um, the scroll speed to change sometimes. But typically, yeah, it's going to be the size of the object that you have frame selected will, will determine sort of uh, the the clip planes of the, the scene view camera and, and some of the yeah, how it moves so it, it's really just these are the controls that I like um, the ones that I just described and, and you know you get used to them and I think it's, they're, they're pretty awesome I, I, I have no troubles getting around the scene view and I, I really enjoy uh, um, using the controls actually it's, it's a lot of fun um, to whip around the scene and, and focus on what you want to focus on uh, and see it from any angle you want, quickly and easily. Um, very important, I guess, for a product productivity sort of standpoint. Okay, so that's one wall done. Two walls to go. Um, so these ones, I'll just do these from scratch. I'll delete. <coughs> well, if I shift, how big are these things? Does anyone remember? <coughs> Cube. Okay, it looks like they're two meters. Alright. My snap settings should be sort of one, 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 one. So I'm going to grab one of these and shift it. One meter, two meters, three meters. Okay. I might change my snap settings to 0.5. And uh, what I'll do now is just delete those couple. Now, the problem with them. Um, this staggered formation is that the tiles were built, Shane built them to be stacked in that uh, in this sort of formation. Um, so might need to tweak the uh, the art assets at some point to uh, to better handle this, this staggered formation. <coughs> so all right, so I've deleted two of those and shifted them, and that seems okay. But you see here, get a bit of uh, clipping. So when we start up the game, and I'll do that now, you'll see that. Uh, I mean, they handled it pretty well, but but they um, still move around a bit. And if they're clipping a bit more, then you probably would have seen uh, everything flip out. So I'll, I'll just leave it for now, as is. Um, Delete. 
Hmm. It's a bit different, this one. So we're done this place that just slightly above it. <coughs> Alright, let's delete those. Yeah, shift them up. No, which ones did I move? Second row. Yeah. Probably better to um, move this row. I guess I didn't actually have to uh, worry too much. I could have just moved the barrel instead, but yeah, actually, let's let's do that. Those. Um, be nice when I can remember all these. I should actually put this stuff into my other projects, and maybe I'll, I'll use it often enough to remember what I'm doing. Um, shift Alt W. Okay, Shift Alt. confusing about the buttons I chose for some of this I think um, I would think that shift alt D would build onto the right Q is normally up um, duplicate right of self D is that actually what it is? Alright. Shift Alt D. It is. Okay, I didn't actually. Oh, yeah. Fair enough. Alright. So, we want to put the barrel. Let's put the barrel on the second row. Let's just do. Same formation on this side as the other side. Delete those two. Grab these. Hold down control to snap. Shift them across. Delete that one. Grab the barrel. Shift it up. And the benefit of the stagger as well is that I don't have to worry about theoretically um, yeah so you don't have to worry about making sure the barrel has uh, bricks sitting on flush on top of it and that sort of thing because these two bricks and, and the formation of bricks around um, support these two, stop them from falling in so that's cool um, that works out well let's go to the level find all blocks. I wonder if there's any particular reason why I've even done that. I don't I might even go back and look at the um look at the original uh video where I built this thing and see why I put a button in there rather than just and doing it at level load. Um might be worth having a look at. Okay, so now we have staggered castle walls. So obviously we can start to see that the, some of the flaws in, in the design of these bricks. Um, so we'll have to look at ways to, to fix that. I think maybe we can look at maybe putting in bricks that are wider. Um, sort of uh, half bricks, if you will. Um, 
maybe maybe go double length bricks and then half bricks so maybe four by two and and then still have two by two ones and and perhaps uh, have a lesser reliance on on uh, I mean I kind of like the, how this works where you know these bricks side by side work together but maybe re remove the reliance on bricks uh, above and below needing to be um, a certain way like <coughs> well it sort of it works pretty well I kind of like having this different angle it's not like it's uh, you know built by a machine or something it's these are hand carved leprechaun hand carved stones and they're um, and they're not exactly flush, so not not straight lined. Looks kind of cool. All right, so now we've got our uh, new fortress. It's got some big gaps in it, so those are the ones we have to plug up with. Uh, we're changing the the brick sizes, but we can shoot into this wall, and there you see a uh, a better looking sort of wall destruction. It's ready to fall, but it hasn't quite fallen yet. But uh, you know, that's a blister bolt, a cannonball. Cannonball would have just annihilated that, I reckon. So look at that. Let's get in there and hit that barrel. Let's have a look at these clouds. Um, start getting those in and, and see how they're looking so far. So, haven't really had too much of a look at these. I'm, I'm pretty interested to see sort of how they go. Drag in the textures. And I'll grab the FBX. All right. <coughs> Let's have a look. Okay. So Shane. Given a uh, an image here showing sort of how he expects the, um, the clouds to sort of work, how how to place them, I guess. Um, so there's a skybox around here which I'll chuck in, and then there's this FBX, and I believe that's <laughs> that's an island. Um, so if we set it up sort of like that, first things first, let's grab these materials, and I believe it's supposed to just be unaffected by lighting and that sort of thing. So set them to unlit transparent and we'll just make it okay. So looking kinda of cool. And the trick will be getting our game camera to um the right <coughs> for right far clip and, and whatnot for these these clouds. Um, so let's grab that skybox and throw that in. Uh, Shane's also I think updated some of the textures with sort of higher res um, higher res versions which we can use for uh, chuck it in now and, and instead of having low res textures as the source we can we can put in the high res textures into unity and use unity to uh, to make them lower for different platforms and that sort of thing um, which is a better way of doing it because you know it gives you more control 
and allows you to you know, build higher res stuff um, for the PC in the same project. So let's change these. Not sure what uh, size these um, skybox images are. Here I'm going to build a skybox material. Um, let's call it uh, whatever. Um, with uh, the skybox, okay. The back, front, bottom, top left and right textures All right. that's very fair call uh, they put in a little hint here saying uh, you know if you've got this gray color the um, you know middle gray color 128 <coughs> then it says you know that's doing nothing there's not you know something affected is uh, being affected by the color um, so you can use the mobile Skybox shader. Um, if you don't need to modify the color of a skybox um, for you know better performance, so it's a good point. Let's do that. Um, replace in the render settings. We can drop in our material for the skybox. There we go. And now we have that sky going. So if we play it, let's have a look at our far clip plane. All right. So obviously too large. Let's bring the clouds down a bit. Don't need to be that large. I think we'll find that just play it and, and tweak it in there. <coughs> um, I think we'll find that the... I need to pair these trajectory indicators or something as well. Okay. Doesn't really matter what size they're going to be. They're probably going to look pretty much the same. Pretty similar. Uh, let's let's go with something like no, let's go with 50. And our camera can definitely be changed quite a bit because near clips don't need to be anywhere near. Um, so if you you don't want to make the the far near clip you know the range too extreme because you get um, you know your precision uh, the, like the depth precision is based on uh, the range of the camera so if you imagine um, uh, your uh, you know, a float or a, a half it depends on you know, if you the depth mode and that sort of thing you can only store um, so many values so if you have a, a a far clip that's you know if a thousand say a range of a thousand from the near to far clip um, and and you let's say you had some sort of the depth was stored in just for example something some sort of format that could only hold um, two thousand up to two thousand as a value then you would have precision of you know half a meter so you can't just go I want the far clip to be you know ten million and not have some sort of impact on things because then the precision in the depth, um, in depth precision will be much worse, uh, like larger increments uh, between each sort of depth amount. So what that'll mean is that it's things that are behind other objects will now render possibly in front of them because, as far as the uh, the game's concerned, or the rendering pipeline is concerned, they're in the same they're on the same level. So, uh, for example. If I was on this this perspective here and I had really poor sort of depth precision, then that brick, um, that brick might be in the same sort of depth layer as that brick from this perspective. Uh, typically, not really a big deal, but you know something to keep in mind. So I'm going to go with that, and uh, I'm going to change it to put five. And 2500 or something, see what that looks like. Okay, 
still not quite 3000 works but probably need the clouds to be as big as they are uh, it's 100 still <coughs> let's go with the yeah, 50 and um, let's go 2000 Okay. Um, clouds. We will now. We can just use those as is. I think that's fine. Um, actually, no. Let's. What we're going to do is build a new prefab for the clouds, and we're going to write a script. Unless I already have one in here. Nope. A script to just rotate the clouds around. It's not going to be entirely accurate. Um, I'm going to just rotate them around the Y to get some sort of movement on them, rotate them slowly. So it'll be sort of almost like you're inside of a tornado, I guess. You'll, when you change from one uh, camera perspective to another, the, camera, the clouds will always be sort of moving to the right, I guess, if I, if I rotate them right. Um, which, you know, is going to look probably a bit strange, but... Um, still, you know, if, Uh, this is you know, a fantastical world. He says that the, the clouds don't do that around these uh, leprechaun, leprechaun islands. It's really just a subtle visual effect anyway. It's not, I'm not too worried about accuracy. Um, I'll just provide uh, an axis. Uh, I'll do two. I'll do two. So this is going to be a fairly handy sort of uh, script to have. You can probably write this one yourself. Just copy this and throw it into your own projects. Um, not too complicated. Very very small script, but just built with enough. Uh, just these three three options here will give us lots of freedom in terms of what we can make this thing do. Alright, so caching the transform for speed and now we're going to just rotate um, around that axis that speed and relative to in this case, the world space. Environment uh, prefabs, clouds. Oops. Cancel. There's a way to. <laughs> never really had that issue before. I accidentally dragged in the managers of Game Object into the project window, making a prefab of it. Now I deleted that prefab. Now it's saying, yeah, it's missing the prefab connection. I wonder if there's a way of removing that in Unity without writing some sort of script or something. I don't want to. recreate it, not that it would take very long, but it's kind of stupid really. I'll handle that in a second. Now let's finish off these clouds. Look at them go! 
I uh, notice in this script I forgot to multiply by delta time. So now they should rotate at 0.1 degrees per second. Um, and that looks alright. I mean they're pretty slow, which is which is good. Yeah, very subtle effects. But as you see, as I move around, hey, they're still moving right. Um, let's have a look at different perspectives. All right, that's kind of cool. You still sort of see uh, some clouds and the angle still all right. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't mind that that effect. You know, we. Quite simple. We could probably do some more stuff uh, later on. Have um, I, you know, I'll try it now, but I think there's already too many clouds. But uh, have this game object and then have uh, another one that was, you know, uh, larger again and rotating even slower, uh, slower. So you have multiple layers of, of moving clouds, and gives you the effect of um, different clouds at different distances. Because at the moment, um, yeah, we've got all these rotating spinning clouds but they um, are all moving at the same speed so they all look like they're at the same distance from the camera um, alright and then yeah, Shane's probably going to keep working on something and build something for the bottom of the skybox to uh, maybe look like there's some sort of surface below or we'll, we'll sort of see what works I guess trial and error um, figure out what looks good. Okay, so happy with those clouds. That's cool. Keep evolving those. Um, yeah, it's interesting sort of way he's built these. Um, sort of multiple layers of these these planes with uh, some sort of yeah lighting information in the textures and it's kind of a uh, it's kind of cool as you shift around. Yeah, they're all in different distances from the camera and stuff, so. And they're, you know, very low weight. They're just, they're just a bunch of planes. With texture on them, nothing, nothing too fancy. But, yeah, it looks alright. Um, but yeah, I think it would look good if. Um, you could maybe separate some of the clouds out. And, yeah, this cloud moves faster than that cloud, moves faster than that cloud. I think that's going to be that's going to be where the uh, it really pays off in the end. The, the uh, I think that's what it's missing right now. So uh, I might get Shane to separate them out, even just in the one FBX, just have a few sub objects of of you know three or four different layers of clouds based on the distance from the camera or from the center. Um, Alright, so this manager thing, missing prefab, um, probably I could look it up. Um, let's just quickly see if we can just write something to, to fix that up. So that's really stupid. Maybe we can also just drag it in here and then. Nope. <coughs> um, debugging general objects, general resize array objects, blah blah blah. Let's go into objects and what I was thinking about actually the other day was that uh, I'm doing a whole bunch of Unity editor stuff in some of these scripts, and if I try to build, uh, it's probably not going to work. Because you can't actually include Unity editor functionality like um, you know a lot, a lot of the stuff that's in this section in um, in the built application. So I'll probably deal with that in an upcoming video when I when I try and build a, a little demo. Um, and I'll show you how to how to handle that situation with preprocessor defines. Um, so for now, I'm just going to include this uh, method up here with the rest of the stuff that I think will need to be in a uh, only in the editor and I'll call this I should probably shift this stuff out too because this stuff is 
stuff for editor functionality, whereas this is more general functionality that could be used in the game. So I might shift that out to a different method or different uh, different class as well. Um, utils game object remove prefab reference or connection. Um, what was that all about again? Uh, Okay, so if there's a selected thing, we want to do the move prefab reference. <coughs> um, okay. So we're doing here. Blah, blah, I don't care about that. So run through all the transforms and I want to remove prefab reference. So how do we do that? Prefab utility dot So we're trying to find something that will make something not connected to a prefab. There we go. Maybe. Give that a go. So that works. Now we have a little uh, remove annoying stupid prefab connection thing. Put it in a little prefab submenu, which we can add other stuff to later. Okay, so that's the wall stuff done. I got the clouds in. We're 38 and a half minutes into this. Let's look at the cannon. So, which one's the one that goes up and down? So this one over here. Let's do this guy as the cannon one. Alright. What I'm going to do is what have I got so far? Weapons, got the catapult, got the ballista. Alright. I'm going to duplicate the ballista, shove it over here, and I'm going to rename it cannon, drop it into there. Alright. Now I'm going to delete this guy. I'll grab this guy, chuck him back at zero for the platform. Alright, cannon is going to have not power but will have the tilting. So, what have we got? Weapon script. 
Shoot power range. 100, 100. Um, come in here. Go to graphics. Come in over. The don't need any of that. Thank you about that. Top aim. Don't care about that. All right. So the cannon. Let's drag the artwork into our project. Make a new folder for it. So, if I'm not mistaken, the cannon will be the sort of steampunky sort of ish uh, weapon. It will come with some cool looking dwarves when they're made. Alright, so we'll drop that in to here. Delete those two. The cannon needs to be scaled up. Alright. Looking good. Uh, I don't believe, it, yeah, it's got no. Um, articulation or anything at this point, it was just a quick export to um, just to get something in. So that's looking pretty sweet. So I think it's going to have a some sort of platform, some sort of gear, um, sort of gear based platform or something like that that it can so we can rotate it, uh, do the aiming left and right, um, and some pretty pretty slick looking. Um, dwarves go with it, so it's looking pretty cool. Um, this has much higher resolution textures probably than, than the other stuff so far. And yeah, I might actually go about um, bringing in some of those textures in a second as well, some of the higher res ones. Alright, so Canon Prefab's got the blister bolt. Let's replace that with. Boulder, bullet creation point, get rid of that rotation, and make it get spawned around here. Might actually not make it a boulder, but instead, you know, something else. Cannonball. Let's have a look at this in relation to the cannon itself. Get an idea of size. One meter looks like it'll do good. Okay. Do we have any materials we can use so far? <coughs> Alright, check on the black or dark grey. Ooh, that's alright. Okay, we should have dark grey material there. For now, as a temporary one. And um Yeah, let's let's go Cannonball blah blah blah, center of mass, zero delete below height, yeah, yeah. Mass. Cannonball What are the masses of these are they just Say so blister bolts two, boulder is ten. We'll make this one um, six for the moment. Change it to continuous dynamic. And all right, back to zero and apply that change. Delete that. Get back to our. Cannon weapon, and we want the shit. I accidentally, instead of replacing the making a duplicate of the boulder, 
I replaced the boulder with the cannonball setup I did. Not a big deal there because one thing the boulder is not actually it's just a placeholder. And also I luckily remember the differences. Alright, it's the boulder. Um, so let's quickly get back to the catapult and set it. No, it's still right, and the cannon. Cannonball, blam. Alright, the bullet creation point is there, it's all good. Um, it's going to get parented to, well for now, just cannon. Um, it's all good. Alright. Projectile trajectory. Weapon tilt points. Um, Alright, don't have a proper weapon tilt point at the moment. It will tilt, so let's give it one. It's temporarily for now. I've got a shortcut for that, don't I? I want to create a child utils game object, create child object, shift alt n. Okay. We'll call this. Uh, um, let's look some sort of pivot. Put that towards the back here for the moment and chuck the cannon underneath that. And set pivot as that. Okay, cannon goes in there. Apply that to the prefab at the moment. Okay, we've got animation component. Aiming side graphics. Aiming side graphics. Is that a thing? No. Alright, so the animation component, blah blah blah. Alright, there's our cannon pointing <laughs> some awesome direction. So it's pointing 90 degrees down for one reason or another. So let's go have a look. The pivot is pointing that way. Cannon, whatever. So the pivot at zero is that, goes up to that negative something. So min tilt, max tilt, negative 30. So I can still move this um, ball back and forth, so I want to change that so it will only allow me to uh, you know, only stay within a certain range because the power should not need to change. Um, so yeah, so when, I, when I don't have any difference between these two I might just make it so shot force is always a certain value, so let's see if I can just do that now. Um, so search for shot force. 
find where it changes. Okay, so update side in, blah blah blah. Alright. Max side aim distance. Okay. What I want is the power stuff. It's a vector two. Shoot power range. So I don't want to change shot force, so distance to point, where is that used? Final position, distance point, blah blah blah. Clamp between max side aim distance. Side aim distance. Whoop, oh, doesn't like that. See what that's all about. Okay. So apparently I've got some sort of part of my code that doesn't like it if min and max side aim distance are the same. Um, distance point divided by zero. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so distance to point, clamps between those, distance to point, shot force is do that. Let's go. Uh you know what, it's probably gonna be simpler just to do this for now. And there's not gonna be any sort of repercussions for that. You can't even yeah, you know, I, I could set it to something like that, and you would never see it move. So I'm happy with that. Saves me having to write some code for uh, to handle that weird case of um, not really a weird case, but just that that case of them both being the same. Cannonball, blam. Okay, well, I guess that's. Fair enough, cannibal just shoots straight through. That's pretty that's a bit better. Okay. <coughs> Might add some explosion so I mean I, don't, I guess not really. I'm gonna have it's gonna be obviously wood as well. We'll probably do some wood based um blocks and depending on a few things, you know, it'd be not interesting to do some wood and splintering and things like that and you know, some sort of dynamic destruction of, of wood would be pretty cool, so I might investigate that at some point. Because um, cannonballs hitting wood, that's sort of cool stuff, splintering the wood. Um, Alright, why does it start on that angle? Let's see why that is. Cannon, current tilt rotation, no. X axis angle twenty five. Okay. Alright, so obviously that tilting is obviously, you know, temporary. It's a placeholder until we get some other sort of tilt in there. Um, take out one of those towers. Boom. 
Alright, that's pretty awesome. You can see from the shot force of that, we took out the tear on the other side just through the sort of chain reaction of, of uh, force moving through those bricks. Now, I don't really want it to be like that, I want it to have very, a higher range of uh, or greater shot force so that the drop off is not that pathetic. So that's, you know, what's the point of that? I'd imagine that this this range between islands is going to be a fairly typical range, not going to get too much less than that, so might increase the, um, the shot force for the cannon. To um, 120, 120. Let's get it a little bit further. I mean, that's why. What's the minimum there? Bam. Yeah, I think that's that's fine. You might get arms that are closer, and you'd want to be able to do something like that. And this way, I can. Oh, that's interesting. The cannonball is not following the trajectory line. Not exactly. So let's have a look at our trajectory line stuff. The where does it get the mass from? Or does it not? So, weapon, shoot power range, we're in a shot force, blah blah blah, shot force. I'm not actually taking into account any sort of mass. I guess it's not mass that's going to matter, it's going to be. Uh, probably the angular drag on the cannonball. Um, and I guess this would be the same for the other the other bullet types. And it's still beneath it. Looks like the. Um, trajectory indicator is... I guess that's fine. Um, what we got? The... bullet creation point is the one. Yeah, it's a bit strange. Angle looks odd. Um, where's the thing? Um. Get these right. So X axis angle. Zero and negative thirty. Okay. That's more like it. Alright, so I just hadn't set my stuff up right. Silly. Um, I won't think about it. Took that angular drag back on. It's the default. Not that it's really going to matter for anything. Um, Alright, so that changes things a little bit. And that's going to be pretty much the same, but. Um, 
takes too long to get back. Look at that. That's weird. Yeah, that's too high. 30 degrees is too much. Let's go a max of whatever that is. About 13 degrees. And so the weapon tilt points make that the same. Oh, it is dropping down. Just double check that it wasn't the angular drag. It might have been the camera perspective that made it look like it wasn't dropping down just before. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it looks. Okay, that is. I swear that was fine. Yeah, that is right. Okay, that's weird. So, perhaps there's no collision on this thing, right? So why would it matter which camera mode I was in? Shoot from this mode. That's dead on. But if I look from this perspective and shoot, it is not. Very strange. Let's try taking any collision off it and see if that helps. Okay, cannonball. Send to a trigger. Or, uh, yeah, I don't know if that should be fine. Make it a trigger, apply that, delete that, play. Alright, so that's fine. So I'm assuming it's colliding with something. All of those look okay. <coughs> Alright. Cannonball. Let's put the uh, angular drag back on once more. Take off that. Apply now it is. There's supposed to be a specific layer. Not yet. I probably have one, but I haven't used it yet. So might as well. Bullet. Apply that. Do the same for these other two. Oops. Alright. So, what could there be for this thing to collide with? There's no collision on this guy. The trajectory indicators surely didn't have collision. Um, I know what it is. It's that side aiming thing. That's why it was only happening in that side view. The um, this plane here, which I used the raycast against when uh, doing this aiming. So it is on. It should be on a certain layer aiming collider and aiming collider shouldn't collide with anything so let's go in here and change that aiming collider collides with nothing alright problem solved and my trajectory indicator continues to be flawless excellent um, yeah, so I'm going to, have to change that wait time because that's far too long. Um, might as well do that now while I think of it. Be nice to not select these things. If I lock it, does that work? Sure doesn't. <coughs> I 
that will. Um, okay. The camera manager. So what happens is we collide with that sphere around the uh, center, and the camera stops. Continues looking at the stuff. Or stops and doesn't continue looking. And then after a certain amount of seconds, it then goes back to the regular view. So what is the regular view? Yeah. Uh, where is that code? Um, I'm going to go to the middle platform center platform somewhere we have the big sphere thing let's have a look shoot, blah blah blah, does all that. We at some point check for the blocks to be stationary, so that's probably in level. Check idle blocks. Okay, so check for idle blocks, initial wait time. So that's that initial wait time's the one. Initial wait for blocks idle. The public in the camera handler. Let's change that to uh, two and a half seconds, or just half the amount of time it takes to return to the regular view. Next thing I'm going to do right after this is get those trajectory indicators parented to something because that's really starting to frustrate me now. All right, so I shoot the cannonball way over. Uh, two and a half seconds later, bam, that's not too bad. Okay, trajectory indicators. <coughs> we have in here, we instantiate them. Indicators, you click there. Alright, we need to parent it to the indicator. So, do we have a this transform? Nope, but we're going to. Set it up in on enable. For reasons uh, I think I discussed in an earlier video, but um, if not, then, then check out um, on the Unity blogs. Um, a talk by Richard Fine. Um, this uh, this talk here by Richard Fine. Uh, pretty good. I enjoyed it. Um, and he discusses sort of um, the ways that uh, Unity, when you recom when it recompiles. At when it's running in the editor, uh, which methods it runs and which ones it doesn't. Say, so for example, it runs on enable, doesn't run on, doesn't run awake. So any private variables that uh, don't get serialized, because it serializes before compilation, deserializes after. All the public variables will be the same. Private variables will be lost. Um, so if you want to restore them um, to to the value you want, um, put it in on enable, and that will run after compilation. Uh, so this transform. Where were we? Right here. So we've got the new indicator. Blah, blah, okay. New indicator dot transform dot parent equals this transform. And probably a money of a modifying its world position, I'd assume. So should be fine. Okay. Might change the initial angle of the cannon. To uh at least be sort of pointing somewhere reasonable. About there. 
Alright, that looks like a decent fall off for the cannon. Pretty happy with that. Alright, we're going to apply that change to the prefab. And now I'm going to just drop another one in. Reset it. Ah, okay. That's right, I keep forgetting that unity of putting that thing so that positions are always uh, set as a prefab override, as you can tell from the, the bull, oh, sorry, the bull, the, the bold um, position text there. Okay, um, cannon shoots, pretty awesome. Um, it's coming together, got those trajectory indicators sorted now, I'm going to start dropping in some of those higher res textures. So, about one hour and ten minutes. Um, still happy to keep going for a little while so not sure exactly what I'll do in this video but just keep 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 at it all right let me um, start updating some of these textures so I'm not sure exactly which one Shane's updated Okay. Stones. Um, I'm just going to drag these into Windows Explorer rather than into Unity because um, if I drag textures into Unity it would not overwrite the existing ones if they've got the same name it would create new ones with and add like a, a 1 or 2 or whatever just append a, a number to their name so if I overwrite them in here these look like the same size skip that skip that um, <clears throat> then it'll actually overwrite the textures and I'll get the higher res ones. So it doesn't look like it's updated the size of the um, those block textures. Looks like the ballista has been updated. has, the platform has. Alright, that should be it. So just the blister and platform, so everything that's on screen at the moment. Alright, so there's higher res stuff, it seems like he's changed the colour as well of, of that texture. So, a Unity by default maxes out the uh, resolution of the stuff to 1024. Um, what I might do for now is just bump it up to 2048. <laughs> yeah. Is that a phone call? Alright, so where was I? Just. Uh, Texture sizes. Yeah, so 1024. Uh, it's kind of actually a bit, a bit frustrating the way Unity does this because. Oh, I'm stoned. <coughs> this, um, this max size here, I don't believe there is a way, but it'd be really great if there was um, a way to, uh, you know, in, say, the quality settings setting the max texture size or doing it per platform or uh, well you can do it per, per well no you can't actually so like setting the, the default I guess per platform would be nice you can write, write um, import scripts uh, to to set it but uh, I haven't actually found a good way to do that in, the, in a way that works how I, I want it to <coughs> so it's a bit frustrating but you know, I can go in here and say, you know, for web, change the max size, or for uh, you know Android, or if I was on the on my Mac, then you know iPhone, 
and that's that's cool but doing it per texture like that one at a time or in this case you can do it multiple now I guess it's cool but yeah you know, it's it's still frustrating like they, they really need to be able to just give you a way of going to some sort of page of hey this is the platform I'm on I want for this platform the max size of textures to be 4096 or 128 or you know just let you change that default max size per platform would be great alright so a bit higher res textures now so it's all looking a bit slicker um, all right, one thing I might do before I end this video is change the camera angles for some of these things because I'm starting to not like them um, the one from top down I think is too too far away um, it just shows too much, it's just not right I think I might probably will set up something later on where I start building more levels to set it based on um, positions of things so it's not just a, a static this is where it is all the time camera angle but it's uh, defined based on I guess you know, also the resolution of the the um, the game, but and, and the, the distance between the objects that you need to see. Uh, so for top down, I'll do the top down one at least because that one you can see I've got all this extra space up here, um, even a bit of space here I don't care about. So for now, I'm just going to change it to um, better accommodate the things I care about. Uh, let's change it while we're playing, so this way we can actually get the numbers. Whoop! Strange. Ah, oh, okay. <coughs> My camera is not. Actually, I'll probably. Alright, um, let's go to the blister, grab top view, let's go to the prefab, bring the prefab in, <coughs> go to the top view of that prefab, um, and assets, I'm sorry, uh, game object align with view, no, oh, no, game object moves to view, align view just like it. Yeah. Alright. That uh, gives us that information. Alright, let's just bring it down. Just do a bit of guesswork. Game object, align with view. Apply that for a moment. Give that a test. A bit better, a bit lower, be spot on. Apply that. All right, so that might do for now. Just a bit better, uh, yeah. Canon one still same dodge. Just drag in the these two prefabs. So all right, it's just a position difference. One thing that is super handy, have I applied that change to the prefab? Did I? I didn't, did I? Did I? Did I? I did. Um, one thing that's really handy um, for that situation I was just in then is doing a custom inspector for the transform component um, and adding in copy and paste stuff for. Uh, the position rotation and the like. Um, 
What are we at? One hour and twenty minutes. I might even consider doing it now. I have one I made before which um, I'm pretty happy with. What I might do is rewrite it now um, and just bring it up on another screen as reference um, so that it doesn't take me as long to write it. And the benefit of that will be that um, <laughs> Well, you'll see that I can not only copy and paste um, uh, position rotation, but I also have support for changing the world or local space um, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I'm going to just bring that up now. Just give me one sec. Alright, so I've loaded up on another monitor the script and now I can start looking at writing, I think this will be the first custom inspector I've done in this project so what I'm going to do is make a custom inspectors folder here I'm going to call it CI transform I'm just going to make up this naming convention for uh, custom inspectors <coughs> where I just do CI underscore and then the, cut in the, uh, the component name so a custom inspector, um, for those not in the know, is basically, you can say for a camera handle, I could write a custom inspector that put a button in to the inspector. When I click that button, it does whatever I want the what I want it to do. Okay, it's not the first one I've written, is it? Because I did write one <laughs> for um, the level. Uh, so, okay, I don't need to explain it because I have explained it earlier. Um, so for the level one, where I write that level editor level helper okay the uh, custom inspector level I'm going to stick with this new convention alright so here, here for example <coughs> I have the button um, so the level one, um, and I'll use this as a reference to start, is pretty basic. It just draws the default inspector, and then so it's a space and then a button. So what I want to do is grab, grab all that, go into my transform one, and go like that. Here it's from editor, not mono behavior, and we're going to override the on inspector GUI method. To draw our own stuff in the inspector. This is the custom inspector for the transform component. Alright. So, the way I did it in keep some of this code the same as my other code. Alright, so I'm just going to copy and paste and describe. Alright, so I've got static variables. Now, <clears throat> the reason for this is I want them to persist as I change from one uh, object to another, one transform to another. So what happens is I write to copied position and then I can grab that copied position out of CI transform I uh, mean, any or any time in the editor from anywhere. So now I've got static variable toolbar int. So I've got uh, a toolbar which has two options: local and world. And this is the the index. For some reason, I've called it int. I might rename that shortly. Um, the index of which one I'm looking at. So what this means is um, I'm providing 
the ability to either look at the local space coordinates or the world space coordinates in the in the transform inspector and I want to persist that setting um, as I change around from object to object so if I'm looking at world space on one if I if I click world the world button and then I go on another object I still want it to be looking at the world space alright this is uh, something I put in for um, to handle sort of a weird error with um, what I found with sort of unity um, Unity's fields for vector threes and the like, they seem to ke keep changing the value constantly even if you didn't do anything. Um, there's some sort of floating point uh, stuff they have in their own editor. So this way um, if you type in something and you enter you know, if I typed in point 0.1 I think what would happen is in Unity it would end up being point zero 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 one or something, you know, it would just be slightly different so this way I've just put in something to um, to allow me to compare floats without comparing them directly just ch check the, the difference between the two um, and now I've got I'll chuck in first this X I'll chuck in first this uh, other method that I've got here reset transforms Uh, no, I won't. I don't want that. Alright. I'm just going to copy this all in one hit and just run through it all and describe it. Okay. So, target transform. So I'm grabbing the target and, and Convert it to a transform just as I have previously in um, the level one. Target is a variable, it's part of, it's, um, part of the editor class. Uh, so, in this case, in the on inspector GUI, the target will refer to the transform class or transform object that we're drawing the inspector for. So, my toolbar int is equal to GUI lay layout toolbar. So, I might rename this now to index. So, GUI layout toolbar is a Unity um, GUI uh, type, rendering type, or, or sort of field type. Basically, you can give it a list of strings or a, an array of strings, and it will print out, draw a button for each one, and you can click on one of the buttons and it will return which index you clicked on and you also have to pass in which one is currently selected so it's sort of um, sort of like a tab menu so one of them will be selected and you can just in it's sort of a good way of just doing like um, yeah it's sort of tabs I guess if you want to have tabbed pages in a, in a window so for position we're going to use um, if the index is zero so if it's local space we want to do this, if it's world space, this. So basically, nothing fancy, just new local position is vector 3 field, local position, target transform local position. So, come back out into our, you see here, Turn off. Let's delete that. Okay. Um, so what I've done is vector three field with uh, a header. So in this case, it'll be local position, then the vector three field. Um, the current transforms local position, and it will return whatever value I type in. So then what I do is I check the squared magnitudes, the difference between um, the new position and the old position and I see if it's greater than the allowed change. So the issue with um, with this is that every single time it renders the GUI I'm doing this squared magnitude. It's pretty fast, it's not really a big deal but you know it's going to be sl slower than the standard 
Um, so what I could possibly do is um, do something to check if if the, I type something in somehow, if there was a change. Um, but this is checking for a change, really. So so there's be another way of finding if you know text had just been entered into the field, and then I can check for if there's a difference between the old and new value. Um, so before I set the new position, I register and undo, set the local position to the new local position. And for world, it's exactly the same, except I use the world position instead of the local. Rotation, same again, except um, yeah, I have to convert to Euler angles as they do here. So the U oh, not Euler, Euler angles, sorry. Euler angles um, from quaternion, same again. So vector three field with local or world rotation. If the uh, and for the angles, I didn't have the same issue. Apparently, <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, I might, I might have, I might need to check that actually. Uh, so compare the the new to the old Euler angles, and if they've changed, register an undo event and set the local or world rotation scale. Um, uh, leaving this out because it's probably more likely to cause more trouble than be beneficial. So I'm not doing lossy scale, or you know, I guess what would be sort of the equivalent of the world uh, positional rotation would be lossy scale. Don't really, you know, that's not really a thing that needs to be done. I don't think anyone's ever going to do that. Um, I, I, I don't think I'd ever would. So I've left it out for now. I could put it in. It's not a big deal. Um, but I've got support local scale. Doing the squared magnitude check. See if it's different, you know, greater than the minimum allowed change. Um, okay, well, difference. <coughs> now I've got copy and paste. So after I print out, so it's basically just printing out these three um, vector three fields here, but either local or world. And for if it's in world mode, it doesn't print out the scale. And then beneath it, I'm drawing three buttons: copy local rot rotation uh, position and scale if it's local space or if it's a world space copy world position rotation so when these buttons are hit I set this uh, static vector 3 to the local position or the local rotation, local scale, world position rotation and I draw those in a horizontal GUI layout area so those will be drawn side by side um, for pasting, I draw three buttons again underneath the the copy ones. So I do another begin horizontal. These will be placed underneath, and I <coughs> um, paste position to local. And I've, I've written it out this way because I want to uh, make sure that it's obvious that you're pasting to either local or world currently so you can copy a world position from one object and paste it into the local position of another object um, and I do an undo before I paste and same for the the world and that's it that's the entire custom inspector nothing too crazy but it's crazy helpful so let me show you uh, an example of how it would have been useful just before. So I have the... I was setting up the camera for the... Um, weapons... Blister and Cannon. So my Cannon camera, top view... There it is right now it's wrong where it's my blister I'd set it all up I'd set it all up I was happy with it it was looking good these two have different uh, rotations I'm gonna change that it's blister 180 is it hmm do that. Probably have to go around and tweak all those now if they're not already overriding rotation. Um, Alright, 
So yeah, the blister top view, sweet as. Camera top view, shockingly wrong and terrible. Now my blister and cannon are in the same position. So I could just go copy their uh, copy the world space position of this. Copy the rotation as well, just in case. Go to my top view here and go paste, paste. And there it is. In the same position as the other one. Now, I could have also, if the cannon was elsewhere, or was a different rotation as it was before. Uh, here's my top view. I could go, you know, if I went and copied the world position and rotation, and pasted them into the cannons one, you'd see that it's the same world position rotation. What I actually want to do in this position, this uh, situation, is copy the local space and paste into local space. And now you see it's correct. So, super, super handy. Um, yeah, I should have put it in there earlier, I don't know why I didn't. Now I'm swap between those two. Set the Okay, copy and paste uh, position rotation scale. Um, yeah, obviously feel free to uh, pause the video and, and and write that out for yourself. Um, super handy to have as a as a custom inspector. And you know, if you have any issues with it or if you improve it in any way, um, yeah, be sure to let me know um, on the forum in the uh, every semicolon thread. And yeah, you know, post new new code, chuck it on the wiki. I, I don't know. Um, all right, so that's that sorted. Video is starting to get on a little bit. Uh, I'm out of things to do off the top of my head, so might be a good time to finish. Let's have one last look at this cannon. Bam! But look at that. What can what can you do against such power? It's awesome. So I was thinking maybe if the uh, if the player shoots you know a cannonball or something at their own stuff, having some sort of cool reaction. Um, I don't think I don't want to have it affect anything negatively. I don't want it to destroy your own equipment. I don't think that would be very fun. But it, like you know, if a cannonball is going towards this guy, um, you know, you might see it coming and panic and and just do some last minute like diving dodge move or, or something. It'd be pretty cool. Uh, all right, I think that's going to do it. So. Pretty fun times. Had um, a fair few things that are covered in this this episode. Looking forward to getting in the rest of this cannon and seeing those dwarves in action. I think Shane's also working on the catapult weapon at the moment, so it'll be interesting to see that happen. Um, probably replace these at some point with some sort of arrow uh, mesh or something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I think this is coming along pretty well now. I um, have to start thinking about things like platforms and, and final controls and things like that. Uh, okay, so this is going to do it for episode 17. Um, I'll probably do episode 18 before too long. I am uh, now full-time Southeast Games for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, hopefully forever, if I can find success with uh, anything I'm doing. Um, yeah, I mean, so far so good. I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Haven't, haven't done a lot of every semicolon. Obviously, this is sort of the first one since that uh, transitions happened. Um, have been pretty busy with some other, some other work. Um, but I will be probably getting on to doing one of these every day or every other day, um, for for at least an hour. So they're going to be increasing in intensity, and and I hope that you know it's not overwhelming for anyone. Um, these are obviously very long videos and, and in combination they are you know, it's pretty substantial length so um, yeah interesting times interesting times um, 
thanks a lot for watching and uh, yeah suggestions feedback unity forums gamedev.net um, youtube southeastgames.com uh, and I've also registered every semicolon.com and, and probably um, thinking about what I can do with this uh, um, you know, that website I'll start posting these videos and, and think about what I can do in the future with the, this uh, every semicolon concept um, beyond beyond just this particular game alright uh, catch you next time